It's uh, good to see a lot of familiar faces again from uh, volunteer events past and hopefully future volunteers as well. Um, we have still some people to come, I think. We've still got a few registrants that haven't shown up yet, but we'll get started because there is a lot of stuff to go through. Speaking of which, we don't expect that everybody is going to remember absolutely everything that we mentioned today. It's why we have a website with a ton of stuff on it. It's why we have Janina, who is a wealth of information, as is Kathy over there on the, uh, on the, on the desk. I'm, I'm learning, yeah, Kathy's our uh, chair of the board of the Tortoise Group, and I assume that pretty much everybody will know who Kathy is. Uh, Janina is the adoption coordinator. I'm Jim Cornell. I'm the executive director. And I'm learning. I've got about at least 30 years to catch up on Kathy in terms of the amount of knowledge that she has. And, uh, and probably about this, well, not quite 30 years with Janina, but she's, uh, she's crammed a lot of knowledge into the last few years. You should all have a folder on your, uh, on your table which will include some of the information that we're going to be going through today. Um, some of them were a bit, a bit of a struggle getting all of the sheets in. They didn't want to be jammed with information, but we did get, some, get it all in there, hopefully. And feel free to write on those. There are pens up at the front. If you didn't bring a pen and want to write on those, feel free to do that. Um, the, the other thing to remember as well is that we're all here to enjoy ourselves when we volunteer. So we do want this to be a fun experience. There's going to be one or two little audience participation things that aren't too stressful throughout the afternoon. Um, we are still all learning. One of the great things, we're going to be going to the Desert Tortoise Council at the end of February and giving a presentation there. And one of the great things about everything in science is that we're always learning. So just because we're telling you things today about tortoises, we're still learning lots and lots of interesting things. Whenever we find new information that's on any of the websites, we always try and post that on Facebook and on Twitter and on our website so that people can stay up to date with the latest happenings in the, in the world of tortoise, such as the fact that they just discovered last year that tortoises can use iPads. I mean, who knew? They've been uh, doing an experiment to find out whether how just how smart tortoises are, and it turns out that they're very smart. They can, they can be trained using an iPad to touch certain parts of the screen, different colors and shapes in order to get fed. So, as I say, we're we're always learning, and it's uh, it's always nice to learn new information. So we're going to learn about Tortoise Group and the current projects because this is primarily for volunteers. So we're going to talk about some of the volunteer things that we do. Uh, we're going to review the laws regarding tortoises and anything that may have changed in the last little while. And there are a couple of things that have changed in the last year. We're going to talk about tortoises in the wild because obviously pet desert tortoises exhibit a lot of those same things. We're going to learn the elements of a pet tortoise or a pet desert tortoise habitat. And what is a good tortoise diet? You'll have an opportunity to sign up to volunteer with tortoise projects and also learn how to adopt with tortoise group. I'm glad we said adopt and not adapt. But uh, we're going to learn how, how you can adopt if you don't already have a tortoise and you want one. You'll also, you'll also find in your, your packages a, a the uh, how to evaluate the session. And also there is a volunteer sign-up sheet so that you can s write down on there the things that you're interested in volunteering with, with Tortoise Group. And of course, we are also going to answer your questions throughout the afternoon. And we also have here, which I will hand out at some point while Janina is talking, some volunteer waiver forms that need to be signed for people that are going to volunteer with us. All right, here's the, a, a very brief tortoise group history. And, and before, I, before I continue as well, I do want to thank all the people here that are already volunteers for all the many varied projects that we have throughout the year. And we have just as many, in fact, probably more coming up in 2015 with a couple of extra ones. 
And anybody who has walked over to the back to see the, the food that's already over there will have walked by Linda, who is volunteering herself today by selling um, candy as a fundraiser for Tortoise Group. And she is selling candy bars for $2 and suckers for $1. And I remembered and got that the right way around because I thought I wasn't going to. But, but uh, there are plenty of opportunities to, to help out. And Linda's helping out with a little fundraiser this afternoon by selling candy for us. So here is a little bit of brief tortoise group history. And this is copied from the abstract that we're going to be talking about at the Desert Tortoise Council. So I do hope that it's correct, because if not, we're going to be giving the wrong information out when we do our presentation in a couple of weeks. We've got a fantastic time slot. We've got 8 AM on a Sunday morning for our, uh, our presentation. So we're really looking forward to, uh, to having about three people in the audience who are all half asleep and needing coffee. But on the bright side, it's at a casino, so maybe we get some of the people coming in by mistake and uh, bump up the audience numbers. But Tortoise Group's been around a while, is, is the basis for this uh, slide. It's been around since the early 1980s, and it was originally set up to give out information on tortoises because there really was no information out there. People had tortoises. They didn't know what to do with diet. They didn't know what to do with habitat care. And Tortoise Group was really formed out of a need for information to be out there. And also to convince Endow, the N Nevada Department of Wildlife staff, to work together to change state law to allow existing captive desert tortoises to be kept legally. And we all know that there's been an awful lot of changes with pet desert tortoises. It makes the news all the time. It um, certainly seems to be a, a hot topic. But it's, uh, it, it's, it's a very interesting subject that, that seems to rear itself in the newspaper every once in a while. In 1982, Tortoise Group was incorporated as a 501c3. And from 1982 to 1986, Tortoise Group picked up and housed an average of 227 tortoises a year, which makes our uh, little efforts in the last little while seem a little bit, uh, a little bit less than than what was happening in the early 1980s, but it certainly shows that the group was really active right from day one. Um, after the emergency federal listing of the desert tortoise as endangered, Tortoise Group joined other stakeholders in creating a habitat management plan for the desert tortoise. So Tortoise Group has been involved not only in the, the pet desert tortoises, but also in working with other groups and with legislation. And it's been at the forefront of all of that, uh, all of that work over the last 20, 25 years. The Desert Tortoise Conservation Center in Las Vegas construction started in, in 1982. Tortoise Group was hired to care for the tortoises. And I believe that Kathy was instrumental in, in that as well. So uh, th there's been a lot of history with Tortoise Group. And until the DTCC itself became functional, and in the latter years as part of the San Diego Zoo, uh, Tortoise Group helped prepare more than 500 tortoises for transport to Reno, where many of them were adopted. So there's been a lot of tortoises go up to Reno. We just restarted last year doing some work with Northern Nevada and taking some more tortoises up there. And it certainly wasn't 500, but 500 was the, uh, that initial number of tortoises that went up there. And many of them, of course, as you know, tortoises live a long time. Many of them are still around. Here's some of the highlights from what happened in 2014. We got a contract with Fish and Wildlife. Um, Janina became full-time staff. I came on as full-time staff. And we got a, a grant from, well, we got a, you know, a working grant with Fish and Wildlife to work on some of the projects that they needed working on. We got a $5,000 grant from PetSmart Charities to help with some of the issues that we have with backyard breeding, uh, which is a, a, a real issue and something that we, we continue to struggle with in terms of what we, what, we need to, uh, what we need to work on is educating the public on, on backyard breeding. And you'll see that there is a backyard breeding sheet in the, in the folder that talks about some of the dangers of backyard breeding. Last year, we had three um, custodians that died 
and they were harboring tortoises in their backyards and, and not through any fault of their own necessarily breeding them by accident because you have a male and a female and all of a sudden you have lots of tortoises. And we ended up with one backyard with 54 tortoises in it. Oh. And I would say that if you had 54 tortoises in a 200 acre property, then that might be one thing, but the property we're talking about is maybe a quarter of the size of this room. So 54 tortoises, uh, that became an emergency that PetSmart Charities uh, gave us a bit, of a bit of a grant for, and Janina was able to adopt out 12 of those tortoises right away to people who didn't have, uh, or who wanted to adopt a tortoise, but didn't have the funds to be able to put in a habitat in their own backyard. So that was a real help with that. Northern Nevada, we have started to develop the group up there that, that is now becoming a chapter of Tortoise Group, and we did some adoptions and some workshops up there, which was a lot of fun um, and also a lot of work. But Janina managed to get some, well, not, not just in, in Reno, but in a lot of the surrounding areas. We, uh, discovered communities in, in Nevada that we didn't even know existed through, through adoptions, which was also nice. And tied in with that, we did a lot of PR. We, uh, Northern Nevada has been really good to us. Pretty much every time we send up a press release, uh, everybody uses it, which is nice. And over the course of 2014, we had press releases that we used in the Huffington Post on the sterilization clinic, and believe it or not, even in the Pakistan Daily News. Now, Fish and Wildlife Service got quoted in that one. I didn't. Maybe it's because my name translates badly into Pakistan. Yeah, I don't know. But uh, Mike Sen from Fish and Wildlife got quoted in there, and, and I didn't. So I, I guess what they did was they just took the first half of the press release and scythed off the bottom of it, which had all my stuff in it. Um, most of that related to the sterilization clinic, which was a first for Tortoise Group, and it was actually a first anywhere. Um, th there have been new developments in sterilization techniques, and so Fish and Wildlife, Endow, and uh, other groups put on a clinic for local and not so local vets from, uh, from the four states where the desert tortoise is found, and held a sterilization clinic to show vets how to perform sterilizations on desert tortoises. And the tortoise, well, Tortoise Group was instrumental in, in pulling that off. I don't know how many volunteer hours we, uh, we put into that, but I, I certainly see some faces around here who helped with that, with that event. Um, it was a lot of fun, it was a lot of hard work, but we certainly pulled it off, and, and I know that without Tortoise Group, that event would not even have happened. So we, uh, we did a great job there not wanting to blow our own horn too much, but we certainly did a, d a good job on that one. And it was something that was definitely a highlight for, uh, for us personally, that we were able to do that. Adoptions continue to be important in 2014. I'm gonna show you a little graph in a second about, uh, about how many adoptions we did in 2014. And hatchling fostering was something else that was, uh, was something that happened in 2014. And here's the adoption timeline. Now I know this kind of fades into insignificance when you think about the 200 or so that were done early on in Tortoise Group's history, but adoptions has really become something more important in the last few years. You'll see if you can read the numbers on there. Uh, two adoptions in 2010 rising to six and then seven and then this year 72 adoption, last year in 2014, 72 adoptions. So lots and lots of adoptions in 2014. And we've set ourselves a goal of 100 for 2015. So if you don't have a tortoise, we need you to sign up to take one so that we can reach our target. Um, but, and, and again, if you don't have a tortoise, then there is adoption information coming later. But we are aiming throughout the state to do 100 adoptions most of them in the Las Vegas area. And it's also something that, in terms of volunteering, it's something that we really need help with. New for 2015. There's a little mix of some of the things that we're doing and also some news. 2015, the Animal Foundation is no longer taking any unwanted pet tortoises. They did have a contract with Fish and Wildlife. They, that is no longer in effect, so the Animal Foundation no longer accepts tortoises from the public. 
Whether that will translate into reality, we still don't know. They've already had a couple come in this year that uh, Janina will be picking up at some point, and, and we'll probably have to adopt those out, but officially, the Animal Foundation is not taking any unwanted tortoises. There is no Desert Tortoise Conservation Center anymore. While the place still exists, um, the DTCC itself is closed, and that was often a place where desert tortoises were kept. In the last year, we helped to get rid of, the, well, get rid of is probably not the best term to say with the tortoises, but we have managed to uh, help get tortoises adopted. We also helped with some of the tra uh, translocations to take some of them out into the wild. And that no longer exists, so that's another avenue that people just can't drop off tortoises. So we, uh, we do have those, those challenges in 2015. Some of the events that will be coming up, and also some of these will definitely need volunteers. Health assessment trainings for field biologists. We're going to be adding a lost and found website page for people who have either lost a tortoise, found a tortoise, who have a tortoise that they need to find a home for urgently. And we also have, which you probably were inundated with emails from us about the upcoming shelter that's going to be started in the next month so that that will be open by the spring. And in terms of volunteers for that, we need a lot. We're going to need people to help to create the thing in the first place, so that's going to be some of the the hard, the hard labor, and then on top of that, once it is open, we're going to need people to help out with working at the shelter, feeding, taking reco records of, of what we're doing out there, making sure all the tortoises are okay, and that should be able to hold up to 20 tortoises, so that's going to be something that's very exciting for us. We're really looking forward to getting that off the ground and getting that running. Continuing from 2014, it looks like there will be two sterilization clinics in 2015. We don't know exactly the format that they're going to take yet, but I think last year we had about between 30 and 35 volunteers help with the sterilization clinics, um, and that help took the form of doing health assessments. It took the form of working on the records. It took the form of um, helping prepare the tortoises for the procedures. It was uh, helping them come out of recovery when they'd been operated on. So th there was an, an awful lot of work. And also just keeping all of these totes with tortoises in them straight when th they all had about 50 different numbers on them. You'd walk in and somebody would say, we need tortoise number you know, D3856 female from, and, and of course, the volunteers knew exactly which tote to go to, which was kind of amazing, but they all had labels all over them and different colored stickers depending on whether they'd pooped that morning or whether they'd had their meds, and it was, it was quite, quite amazing to see. So we'll be doing a couple more of those where we'll need lots of people. Um, Northern Nevada, we'll still be moving our efforts there to find homes and adopt more tortoises than we did this year. Hatchling Foster Program was supposed to be for one year, whether it stays as one year, we have absolutely no idea. Um, Kathy's been working on the ha Hatchling Foster Program. And also public outreach through events, PR, uh, creating more printed materials. And public outreach is also something that we definitely need help with. We probably could have attended a lot more fairs and, and uh, events than we did last year had we had the volunteers to be able to do it. Um, it, it's, it it's great to have people at these events, and certainly Janina and I go to as many of them as we can, but we also need other people to, to help us out. It's just every once in a while we need the restroom or we need to go and grab something to eat, and we also need, uh, we, we need people that are trained, such as yourselves here today, that know something about tortoises so that you can convey that information to the public. All right. Janina's going to come up and we're going to do our first little mini activity. Okay, so um, first off I want to, you know, say thank you for everyone for coming. I'm really excited um, about this new year and um, I'm so happy to see all of you here and I hope you're excited about this new year too. So, but real quick, I know uh, we just got settled down, but uh, you guys have questions, correct? I'm sure. No, no questions? 
we can go home. Okay, so I have a, a very quick activity. Maybe we'll even take maybe five, eight minutes, not even 10 minutes, so we need to come back. Um, I have these pieces of paper all around the room and I have markers. I want you to write down your questions. I don't care how silly you think they are. I want to know, um, uh, does, do tortoises eat meat? I, write it down. If you don't know the answer, I'm okay with it. Just write it down. So uh, go ahead and break up and stand up. And we, we have three hours, so this is a chance to get some activity in you for a minute. Um, and the, the other thing that we want to mention about the questions as well is that if you're helping us out at a, we've got a little makeshift booth here, but if you're helping us out at a booth, say at the Pet Expo in a couple of weeks, what are the questions that you're totally petrified of being asked? So it might not necessarily be a question that you have, but it might be they're going to ask me about they're going to ask me about Bunkerville. I just know they are. Uh, or what, what, are, what are the questions that you're you, you're afraid of, or that you're not sure exactly how to answer? And one of the answers might just be, "There's Janina. Ask her." But, um, but but we also want you to write down any questions that you think you may have that will come to you and that you really don't not sure of. So Janina's got some pens. Uh, if you want to. Come up and grab a pen and write down your questions. We'll just we'll start talking for a few minutes while you uh, while you do that, and it'll also give you an opportunity to uh, to write down on whichever sheet that you want. One of the things that I did want to point out when I mentioned about 2015 and the Animal Foundation and desert tortoises and the, de the desert tortoise conservation center being closed. Um, it really means that the onus is now on Tortoise Group, because Tortoise Group <laughs> is, is the only the only show in town, I guess, now when it comes to tortoises. So we are going to bear the brunt of pretty much everything. Most of the media inquiry is going to come to us. Most of the questions on tortoises from the county, from everywhere, are all going to come to Tortoise Group. So while we n aren't necessarily going to know all the answers, we certainly have to be the place to, to, uh, to try and at least work on all of the problems that we have. I guess the next section that's coming up is the law and the tortoise. And that's going to be Janina. So as she works her way back over here without falling and dropping the sheets of paper, I'll hand over. Thanks, Jim. So, um, thanks. So we got some of your questions out there, and I was walking around the room, and they look awesome. Um, we're just going to jump right into the nitty-gritty, the law and the tortoise. Um, you know, they, they do have some laws regarding them, and they might be a little different between uh, wild tortoises and pet tortoises, although they are the same species. You know, go for a saga CZI. Um, so, as Jim already mentioned a few things, um, they are listed as threatened by the Endangered Species Act, wild tortoises. And, and pet tortoises. Um, it, the final decision to list them as threatened was in 1990. And you're not allowed to sell, disturb, harm, touch, get close to, um, and that includes remains. Um, uh, I do have that question a lot. Uh, can I go pick out uh, tortoise shells from the desert? No, that is, um, they're protected as well. It's a $25,000 to $50,000 fine or one year in jail or both. So um, don't collect tortoise shells, please. <laughs> Um, so uh, wa another law for um, wild tortoises is the, uh, they're all protected under N Nevada revised statutes. Um, and so they have federal laws and state laws protecting wild tortoises. So let's get into pet tortoises. So, uh, you know, that how do you, first, how do you, can you tell if it's a pet tortoise or a wild tortoise? Well, it takes a little of investigation, but yes, you can. Um, pet tortoises aren't really scared of you. Wild tortoises uh, usually are. Um, they'll sink into their shell, get really scared. They might pee if you get nearby. And that's, uh, we all know that that might be the water that they needed for the next, um, well, maybe we don't all know. The, that might be the only time that they have water for the next six months. So that's one reason why you're not allowed to approach uh, wild tortoises on purpose and harass them. They'll pee and then they will dehydrate and die. So. Um, Pet tortoises aren't really scared of you usually. They love to sniff your toes. <laughs> um, uh, the shells, you can kind of tell pet tortoise shells are usually nice and you can see the lines and everything. Wild tortoise shells are usually have uh, scrapes, scratches, bumps. 
uh, maybe a coyote tried to eat them one time. So um, that there's little subtle things you can tell. And again, where, where you got the tortoise, did your neighbor get it from? You know, did your neighbor give it to you or did, were you out in the desert? So those things too. Um, but in the Endangered Species Act, um, they are protected, but you may continue to keep captives and progeny as pets, so the babies of the captives. Uh, they're allowed to keep as pets. Um, so it's legal to have a pet desert tortoise as long as you register it. Um, and that would be on our website, and I'll, we'll show you the website later on today. But if you register it through Tortoise Group, um, and one of the newer laws regarding, regarding uh, pet desert tortoises is the May, uh, as of May 2013, there was a Nevada state uh, regulation passed that limits new custodians to one tortoise, and that was in efforts to curb tail breeding. It's uh, going to be a long time uh, issue for these tortoises live 80 to 100 years old, as we'll learn. Um, they're going to breed for a long time as well. So. That was the, the whole reason uh, as to why they passed the <laughs> Nevada regulation. And we, abide, we have to abide to all those laws. As you know, that we, we get funding from Fish and Wildlife, Nevada Department of Wildlife. We work with them. Uh, our program sticks to these laws. Uh, I want to mention well, uh, another federal law um, in 1975, so before the desert tortoise was listed as endangered. Um, eggs and hatchlings under four inches shell length are legal to sell or trade. Uh, or adopt to the public. And that was just to limit salmonella uh, infection in children. Uh, we all know, well maybe we don't all know again, uh, baby tortoises are adorable. And uh, so kids think sometimes that they're toys. And especially toddlers would put them in their mouth. So, uh, and that's how they would get salmonella infection. So a tortoise group is not, we are not regulated to adopt out hatchlings. And that is the reason why. Um, one thing, even pet desert tortoises, um, because of Nevada state laws, you're not allowed to take it across lines. Um, even if you're moving, I'm moving to Utah, can I take my tortoise with me? Legally, no, you're not supposed to without written uh, permission from Nevada Department of Wildlife. So you'd have to contact them and if, if you had to. And one thing I just want to mention because they are protected by Nevada state law, they are a state reptile, by the way. So that's a nice fact. Um, you, they do not actually belong to you. All desert tortoises belong to the people of the state of Nevada, so they belong to all of us. And that means that we are their custodians. And that's why you'll, you'll see the word custodian used instead of owners or pet owners. Um, and that's your tortoise belongs to everybody. <coughs> we're, uh, we're going on to wild tortoises now, and th the question was about the desert tortoise range. This is pretty much the range of the tortoise. Uh, we, there's, there's no way that we can give you all the information that we wanted to give you in, in a three hour period, but we were gonna show you all the different ranges of tortoises across North America, which is kind of cool. There are several species of tortoise in North America. The one that we have here is Gophurus agassizii, and it is the, the black up on the map, map there as opposed to the gray, which is the other species of desert tortoise that is divided by the Colorado River. Now, the Colorado River there looks like it goes all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. It kind of really doesn't flow into the Gulf of Mexico anymore, but um, Gophurus morophkai is the other species. That's the Sonoran desert tortoise, and that's that's the eastern the eastern kind of desert tortoise. Ours is the one on the on the west of the the Colorado, and you'll see that it just reaches into Utah. It's not as if it's a, a statewide reptile, but just Utah, a little bit of Arizona, quite a bit of California, and the southern portion of Nevada. And that's why when we adopt to northern Nevada, we have to take special care and special precautions because they're really not used to living in cold temperatures. They like the, the heat of this particular region, and so when, they, when people adopt them in the north, they have to go inside in the winter. So that's a, a whole new ball game when it comes to doing the adoptions up there, but we, we treat them very differently. 
How does a tortoise survive in the harsh desert environment? They don't have air conditioning the same as we, we do when we, we go inside, but they do have lots and lots of strategies for dealing with the extreme environment that we have here. Um, one of the things that we should mention is that they've had about 65 million years to perfect their adaptations. Uh, humans certainly haven't been living in, in this particular region for a great length of time. So desert tortoises have adapted over many years. They are cold-blooded. We're going to go through these in a little bit more detail over the next coming slides. But they're cold-blooded. They go through brumation. And another word for that is, well, brumation is the reptile version of hibernation. And estivation or estivation, depending on where you're, where you're from. <laughs> It's kind of like the aluminum and al aluminium for the uh, English people here, which is myself. Um, and the ability to burrow, sensing the approach of rain, which is a really useful thing when it rains maybe once every couple of, uh, well, maybe, maybe only a couple of times a year. Conserving water and being attracted by color of the flowers that we have here. Cold-blooded. A tortoise is an exothermic reptile. The other word for that, if you want to be really smart, is poikilothermic. Um, if you want to impress somebody when you're standing at the booth talking to people, just throw out poikilothermic. It, if they ask you to spell it, you may be in trouble. But um, they, they receive their warmth from the sun. So they basically take the temperature that is surrounding them. If we're in, co in, in cold places, we stay the same temperature pretty much because we can adapt. The way that cold-blooded creatures live means that if it's cold, they're cold. If it's hot, they're hot. So they have no ability to heat themselves. They have no ability to cool themselves. So that's why their position on the earth and also their position in and around where they live is very important. If they're trapped in the sun in the hot summer, they'll overheat and die. And similarly, if they're trapped in cold temperatures, they will also die. They achieve the optimal temperature, which is about 85 to 95 degrees, by moving in and out of sunlight. So if it's cold, they'll try and get somewhere warm. And if it's too hot, then they'll try and get out of that heat. Here's, here's the... Uh, photograph of a desert tortoise in the wild just kind of hanging out and basking and as you as almost everyone here has a tortoise you'll know the behaviors that your tortoises exhibit when it's cold or when it's warm whether it'll in especially in the spring when the temperatures are starting to warm up and it'll bask um, might not necessarily go back into its burrow because it's or in the burrow than it is outside. So they, they'll use all kinds of different techniques to, to uh, adapt to their surroundings. So in the early spring, the late fall, as I just said, they'll, they'll bask, they probably sleep outside. And we do get a lot of calls throughout the year with people that their tortoises are exhibiting behavior that they're not really expecting. So that's why Kathy puts out a tortoise tip every uh, once in a while. Often they're very opportune. I know that when we had rain coming a couple of months ago, Kathy th put out a really quick tortoise tip because it was going to rain. Because we will start getting calls from people saying, it's November and my tortoise should be asleep and it's out because it's raining. Well, we, we try and answer those questions, hopefully sometimes before they, they actually come. Uh, in the spring and fall, you'll see high activity because it's warm, their, their bodies are warmed up and they're, they're happy, highly active, eating, exploring, um, escaping the yard if they have that opportunity. In hot summer, we also get the same questions. My tortoise hasn't come out for a few days and that could be because it's 120 out and they're really just thinking, it's too hot out there. I'm just gonna stay in my burrow and stay at a reasonable temperature for a few days and escape that hot summer heat. And in the winter, of course, they brumate, and that's the other name for hibernation in tortoises. 
There is a slight difference. Hibernation with mammals is, is when an animal will eat lots and lots and lots and live off that storage throughout the winter. The reptiles do exactly the opposite. They don't eat before they go into brumation, and they basically just slow down their bodies and, and survive the winter that way. And they'll do that from mid-October to mid-March or April when all of the phone calls start again saying, my tortoise comes out on March the 23rd every year and it hasn't this year, what do I do? <coughs> and uh, and th those calls will start. And, and some tortoises you pretty much can set your, your clock by in terms of when they come out and, and also when they go into sleep. Um, but of course, a lot's gonna depend on temperatures, ambient temperatures. Uh, we, we might go through a really warm spell. We might have some rain when tortoises will come out. So you, you really can't tell, but uh, we do have, we do try and give answers to people that panic about the fact that their tortoise hasn't emerged yet. And some of them, it's, it's quite considerably later than others. I know that some people's tortoises will emerge really early and other people's, it may be, it may be even as, as late as uh, the end of April, early May, when they decide that they're gonna come out again for, for the summer. So as with all of us, the basic needs, other than cable television, are shelter, food, and water. So all the same, depending on whatever animal you are, you need those same things, shelter, food, and water. So shelter here, you'll see, see if I can do this without, I don't know where my pointer is, it should be, there we go. You'll see that these burrows in the wild are tortoise shaped, or tortoise shell shaped, nice, rounded top and flat at the bottom. Typical burrow will be close to a wash. They need that, they need to be fairly close to water. They're gonna have vegetation, they're gonna have shelter there, they're gonna have shade. And here you'll see the tortoise going in. And they adapt by getting out of the heat, getting out of the cold, and using a burrow in the earth that's, that's snug. They certainly won't dig one that's eight feet wide because the reason for this being snug is that it will keep them warm when it's cold and it will prevent um, prevent them from overheating when it's hot. So that snug burrow is very important and that these are things that Janina will talk about when we talk about creating burrows and creating habitats for them because what we're trying to do as best we can is mimic and copy what they would have in the wild. Tortoises are herbivores, they're vegetarian. So the, the question, does my, can my tortoise eat cat food, is, is answered right there. The answer is no. They will depend mostly on the things that they can find in the wild. So tiny annuals, small grasses, things that they will find in the wild. Now here's a small desert plant, pectus. And you'll notice here in the background this blurry black object is a lens cap from a camera. So you'll see just how small some of these flowers that they have to rely on for food are. Uh, when it comes to eating tortoise diet that we give them, they get an awful lot more than they get in the wild, which is why we, we see a lot more growth than we do in the wild. But again, Janine's gonna talk about that. I don't wanna steal her, steal her lines. So here we'll see cacti, we mentioned that bright colors attract tortoises, they love color. They'll be attracted to this and they will eat that. Um, they, they won't eat cacti because you'll see a little nibble there, maybe that's the desert tortoise took a bite out of one and then decided that's not very nice because high in oxalates, not good for tortoises and they won't eat that. They may eat the new pads if they're available and, and within eating distance they may eat the new growth because that's not bad for them, but in general, it's the flowers that they're going for. And here's globe mallow, another one that uh, Janina's gonna talk about when she talks about plants, and plants that are, are good for desert tortoises. Tortoises will smell approaching rain. Um, if it's going to rain, tortoises will come out and get ready because they know that it's not the case that they can go and find water anywhere else. They'll sense rain, they'll wait in places where water pools, they may even dig or dig a, a, sh a shallow basin of their own, a little 
bit of uh, earth where they know that they can create something where water is going to gather when it rains. And here we have some area where the, where the water is going to gather, where, uh, where the rain water can be readily available before it sinks quickly into the soil. And here's another photo just for the sake of it, with little tortoises in there getting a, getting a drink. Tortoises can take in water through their nose, their mouth, a little bit through their skin, and their cloaca. Their cloaca is their, the, the hole at the back where everything happens. It'll take water in that way. It's where the poop comes out. It's, it's pretty much multi-purpose, but the cloaca is certainly uh, important when it comes for, to, uh, to water. And we mentioned the in one end out the other. Urine is made up of fluid, fluid which is the, the water portion, and also these urate salts here. It's another, it's another common question that we get about, uh, about diet and about feeding is, is this normal? And absolutely, this is normal. It's one of the questions that you'll see in the FAQ sheet that's in your, your folder is, is, about, uh, is about pee, and this is definitely okay when it happens. Pet tortoise habitats and care. That means that's over to Janina, the, uh, the ad our adoption coordinator. Okay. Uh -oh. So we just learned, uh, you know, the basic needs of a wild tortoise. And, and Jim mentioned what um, one of our goals is, is uh, when we have a pet tortoise habitat, is try to figure out what's still going to be safe in our backyard, but that is somewhat natural behavior for a wild desert tortoise because they are the same species even though your pet tortoise might not have been wild at one point. Um, that's what's comfortable, that's what they've uh, been evolved to do and um, live. So we want to provide a similar uh, shelter, food and water for a pet desert tortoise and I think that's Tad. I think that's Tad. Um, so he has a nice snug burrow here, and, and it looks beautiful, but um, we don't want it collapsing on him because one thing about our yards is that we're meant to run around in our backyards and jump up and down and do stuff that in the desert doesn't happen very often, so we don't want them to collapse, so that's one thing that we'll talk about. But he has a, a nice burrow that will not collapse on him. Um, so. Again, with the burrow, it's the most important feature. They spend 95% of their time, maybe even more, um, in their burrow. Um, we want it to be dry. A wet burrow will cause a tortoise to become sick, so we want a, a, a nice dry area. Um, I'm looking for, when I'm going to someone's yard, at least 600 square feet. Now, that's pretty small. Um, a wild tortoise can have a home range, which is everything in, in that he needs to survive of it's kind of astounding, 100 acres, 100 square acres. So even though he only uses about two or three acre, square acres usually. So a backyard is already going to be small. But one thing that we are trying to do is we're trying to adopt a tortoise into a safe area as best as possible, as long as there's food, shelter, burrow, water. Um, and we think your tortoise will be happy there. We're going to do it. So uh, some of our paperwork says 1,200 square feet. but because we have such a high need to find homes. We're, we're willing to work with people. So these are, again, the requirements for adoption. We're gonna see, we're gonna see all this stuff, so let's just keep going. Um, again, the shelter, 95% of the uh, time spent in its burrow, uh, snug with little air circulation. Um, the earth is the insulating factor for me, so that's dirt, pretty much. We have a certain type of dirt that we like, it's called chat, and we can talk about that a little bit later. But the more, the better. Uh, some burrow plans, some people think putting a, a piece of plastic on the inside of the burrow, not a tarp when it rains, that's a little different because you can remove that, um, but we don't want any plastic on top of the burrow as when water gets trapped in there, it'll stay trapped in there and it'll stay humid. So we do want the, the burrow to be able to breathe a little bit with the dirt. We want it to get, be able to get dry after a big rainstorm. That's the whole point. 
Um, these are our new borough plans that we started using last year. They're a little bit of an ad adaptation from what we used to use. Again, th there's wood on the bottom, wood on sides, and this doesn't have the top on it, but there would be wood on top as well. And, um, and then we'd put dirt on here. Tortoise has, can walk down here, turn around, and come right back out. And this is a, a nice above ground burrow that's uh, finished with a lot of this chat on top. Uh, above ground burrow, you don't dig, so that might be a plus in your yard. Um, they won't flood because they're above the ground level. And you can stick your head down in this little hole and always see your tortoise's, your tortoise's bum or not. He's there or not, so you don't have to worry. Did, did he escape? That's a good, that's always a question. Uh, this is an underground burrow. It's very similar. And there's wood on the bottom here, but we've put dirt on the inside. It's dug about two feet down in the ground, 18 inches to two feet. Um, we have grow boards here that I'll explain a little bit later. This is what helps keep the burrow snug. And again, we, we did attach a top to this and then cover it back up with dirt. You can use um, some rocks to hold dirt here, some boulders or something else just to hide the, hide the wood. So you can be a little creative in that aspect. Um, so again, we want the burrow to be snug. And that's for the, the same purposes of keeping your tortoise warm in the winter and cold in the summer. And so we do have plans on our website. And if I've been to your home, I've given you these. These are our burrow plans. This is the underground burrow plan. We've even shown you exactly how to cut the wood. So if that helps you out a little bit, we've uh, had a Home Depot uh, give the guy a couple extra bucks and he'll cut it all for us, so that makes it a little easier. So this is, who is that? Somebody should recognize him. That's Max. <laughs> That's Max, and so this is, uh, this is just the beginning. This is the frame. Max was, um, I can't remember exactly, we'll say six inches wide, and he just needs just, oh, maybe another inch and a half here of room. We don't want his shell to scrape down. And these are the grow boards. This is how many we had to use for him. Now, in a year, or maybe even a half a year, uh, but it could be up to two to three or even five years, you can yank one of these out so that these burrows are good for the next 20 years. Kathy's, I believe, is 19 years old, your burrow that's somewhat similar to this? 15? Oh, okay. Pretty close. And we have a little video that I'm just going to show you on how to build a burrow. This is a Antonio, our contractor. He, he's great. He does it all in one day. Oh, that's not it. Oops. I'm, that's a hatchling habitat. That was not Antonio. I copied the wrong one. Um, maybe I can get it back up. Um, I'll see if I can do that during the break. Uh, how best to feed a tortoise, though? So now we're on to food. Um, we want to provide browsing capabilities, and we'll talk about lots of plants, because in the wild, that's what your, your tortoise would be doing. He'd be browsing, wandering around, looking for flowers to eat. Um, and sometimes they're picky. Sometimes they'll eat one flower in the spring, and they won't touch it in the fall. Or maybe you planted something that uh, you thought he would just love and gobble up, and then he won't touch it. And then three months later, you go out to your backyard, and it's devoured. So that's why we want a variety. Maybe they're interested in something um, that, uh, that you weren't sure if they would be. Uh, again, then you'd be, they'd have food when you want to go on vacation. Then you don't have to worry about them so much. That would be nice. You don't have to have, uh, he doesn't need a dog sitter, you know, a tortoise sitter. You don't need one of those. Um, and one thing that we have learned from the San Diego Zoo, who did a research on the thousands of tortoises that were in their care, was that a, a good diet for a tortoise is something similar, consistent, something the same, pretty close to every day, and that would be plants in your backyard, and then supplement with a mega diet tortoise chow. And um, so we do feed tortoise uh, mega diet uh, wet. It's not meant to fed, 
to them dry, not in the, and the pebbles will look at you like, what, what happened? So you do want to feed it to them in a juicy mash, a little water. We have a picture I'll show you. And the mega diet a couple times a week, two to three times a week, or a little bit less every day. Just depends on what your work schedule is because they'll come out in the middle of the day in the summertime or spring and you're not home. So um, we want to try and stay away from lettuce. Lettuce doesn't have uh, many nutrients in it whatsoever. Good for us and our waistline, but not so good for tortoises. They will eat it, uh, but we've learned that it is not uh, very good for them. Any type of fruit, they have a really hard time digesting sugar. And if you imagine, think about a wild tortoise. What sugar opportunities does a wild tortoise have? Very, very little. They might have some fruit from a cactus once every three years, maybe. And, th and that cactus, it, it's not going to be high in sugar content as well. Um, that, unlike the fruit and vegetables that have been produced for our consumption, because we love sugar, so that's going to be, a, our, our fruits and vegetables are an extreme amount of sugar compared to anything that a, a wild tortoise would receive. Mixed salads, again, it's something that gives them uh, you go to the store one week, you're going to buy something, and then next week you're going to buy something different. Um, that upsets a tortoise uh, stomach. They do receive, they get colic from that, and uh, it's a really painful gas, so it, it disrupts their digestive system. They're very similar to uh, a grazing animal that we've learned, and grazing animals usually eat the same thing over and over again, and so do tortoises, and we want to try and help them so they don't have that painful gas. Here's Mega Diet, all wet and juicy. And mounded up in a little mountain there so he has easy access. I do it a couple times for them to munch down that mountain and then they get it all over their face and then I knock it off their face with the towel or my finger. So it's kind of fun. Um, I'm going to quickly go through. We do have the plant sheet here. This has everything on there. Uh, many of it you can just get at a, uh, maybe even Home Depot, Lowe's, most likely Star Nursery. Dandelions are excellent. Petunias, this has a little cover over them so he can go and eat the, the flowers but doesn't destroy the, the plants. So you might have to be creative and different things like that. And that's one thing that our monthly meetings do is what we uh, pass along um, these tips and tricks. Hollyhocks are great. We usually, we have a wonderful volunteer that brings our seeds in for those every year almost. She's done it a couple times. Spineless cactus. <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> there, there she is, yep. I haven't planted mine yet, but I will, I promise. I still have them. Uh, this is, I want to talk about the, the green new growth pads of the spineless cactus. Again, those don't have the oxalates that Jim mentioned. Oxalates bind calcium, and as uh, everyone, definitely a tortoise needs as much calcium as he can, but it, with any sy system, you need as a lot of calcium. So oxalates are in these gray parts of the cactus, whereas there's less oxalates in the new growth of the cactus. So. Uh, I The flower and the fruit? The fruit. The fruit. Are they allowed to eat that? Yes. Yeah, that's a, it's a cactus fruit. It's going to have way less sugar than, than anything that we would take, give them from the store. So that's probably okay. That's probably the only fruit that would be okay. Got, and then we're going to, wonderful grapes. I always recommend a grape in every yard I go to just because they grow fantastically. And you can do a lot of fun things with them. This one is... Um, has a wire up here, and it's so the the grape grows along the wire and creates a little habitat slash shade for him, and then he can go around and eat it. Um, but you do want to trim the grapes. The grapes these are commercially commercial grapes; they're not native grapes, so you would want to trim the grapes. Yellow trailing primrose, gazanias, those grow really great. Globe mallow, again, another native plant. Um, it's orange out in the desert if you go to Red Rock in the spring, but you can get it at um, sometimes at Star Nursery when pink and purples, and it's a favorite. A lot of landscapers just 
pick them all up, so you might want to call about that. Mexican Evening Primrose is gorgeous. Purple little, little flower, they use that in the landscapes a lot. And under the water dish, so we see a little water dish here, it's sunk down into the ground. This is a neat picture because this is a contraption that was created to help uh, seedlings grow or plants that have been nibbled on too much and you just pick it up with the handle and put it on top of the plant. So um, other people will plant plants and planters and tip them onto their side for one day. Um, again, Jim mentioned how tortoises drink water. They, they do it four ways. Uh, nose, mouth, skin, and the cloaca. The cloaca is the, the back end opening. They only have one opening back there. That's where everything happens. Um, reproduction, um, just everything. Uh, urination. So what your dish needs, it needs to be big enough for the tortoise to completely get into um, and sink down in and spend some time there. So I always recommend a terracotta drain plate as big as possible that you can get. Um, and they still will drink from puddles when it rains too. So, And you might need to soak your tortoise every once in a while before and after uh, brumation just to make sure that they're well hydrated. And this is a picture of the cloaca. If you, if you were wondering. Uh, this is an inadequate dish, although he can get his face in there. It, it's just not what a wild tortoise, uh, it, it could be what a wild tortoise does if he had to, but really to ensure that they are well hydrated and flushing their system, they need to be able to soak their whole body completely. Uh, here's some examples. Some people have created a shade pr pavilion because we don't want it in the sun because it will get really hot. Uh, these folks also put their drip line to it, so it automatically fills once or twice a week whenever that's set. And then we already saw that one, but here's another one. Here's a bigger shade pavilion. So there's some, you don't have to do one of these, but you do want it in the shade, definitely. Uh, gate barriers, so you guys already, ex you know, said that they do move extremely fast. And one thing that they do know is when that gate gets left open by the landscaper, air conditioner guy, um, if you have a pool, just the Cox communication guy, the dish guy, they know when that gate gets left open. And that's what's really sad is that uh, hopefully people get our phone number, or our email address, or they know to call us and we'll do our best, and especially with our new website. Uh, we'll make sure it gets on there. But if they don't know, they think it's wild. They always think it's wild for some reason and who knows what they'll do with it at that point. Um, or they think it's a nice pet and they keep it. And, or they think it's worth money and then they sell it, which we all know is very, is highly illegal. But 18 inches. Great question, Bob. We recommend 18 <coughs> inches. 12 <coughs> inches is, is just a little too short for adult tortoises. Um, at, you know, they can kind of stand up and reach their, their neck out. So if they can see that light, to go out, they'll, they'll know that there's an exit there. So 18 inches is a good rule of thumb. I believe this one's 24. Yeah. Yeah. Some, some people have even used it as a, as a good thing for their dogs. Uh, the main point of it is that you are meant to still open your gate. So you can see this person is standing in between the gate and the gate barrier. And you can paint it white or some color to match the gate. Uh, this is one that they used some L brackets. And I have a, this little gate barrier demonstration shows a couple different ways you can do it. Um, this also has something flat on the bottom. This was a construction guy, so he poured cement. But you don't have to do that. You can just use bricks or flagstone. We want the gate barrier to be on something flat because, well, if it's not on something flat, there's going to be light that the tortoise can see through and he'll want to dig. And then if there's not something there, he can dig and he can get out, especially if you're not checking on it every three days, four days, a week, or even one day. I have a there's Jim, this is kind of a, a fancy gate barrier, but it, 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 the p whole point of it is that it's flush the ground pretty close and that you can still use the gate 
uh, quickly go uh, over it if you need to. So we're going to talk about hazards. And pretty much the main hazard that I'm probably worried most about is flipping over onto backs. And if they are stuck in the sun, we learn that they can't regulate their body temperature. They don't pant, they don't sweat, they don't shiver. Anything that we do to regulate our body temperature, they can't do. So they are going to quickly become, if they're stuck in a situation, they're going to get up to that 120 degrees or maybe sometimes hotter if they're stuck there for long enough. Uh, ponds, pools, large drop-off steps for flipping, uh, places to get stuck. So we're going to look at a few different things. Uh, another one is tortoises that are fighting. We get calls all the time from people who had two little tortoises and they grew up together and that about, and we're going to learn more, that about seven to eight inches in length they become sexually mature and then they come out and they start fighting with each other or mating or both. So um, that's, a, that's a pretty bad hazard. They do draw blood and flip each other over and if they're stuck in the sun on their back, they're not going to make it. Um, so we did learn that tortoises see color really well, so they can see balloons and bits of plastic. And that's one reason why uh, you, you might, see, might have learned that we don't release uh, plastic balloons out in the desert because they're going to go and a wild tortoise is going to eat it. And especially if they eat this long string, tortoises don't throw up at all, and so they have to keep eating. And a tortoise, if he ate all that, probably isn't going to make it. And so that is one thing that you do need to do is just pick up litter in your, in your yard. We all get it. We Just after a big, a lot of uh, wind, big windstorm, we all get it. So keep, be mindful of that. And at the clinic, we saw, we saw one tortoise that uh, had, was pooping a Snickers bag. So that was sad. <laughs> But we did see it, and he made it. So he, got, he thought that was a nice place to go, but I don't think he can get out. Um, two tortoises trying to escape there. <laughs> <laughs> Although adorable. He can either flip onto his back uh, backwards or flip onto his back forwards. Um, so we do want to make sure that uh, 18 inches high is a good rule of thumb for any walls as well as a gate barrier. Flat. Um, this is just real quick. This is a couple of pictures of a yard. I want, this is someone's home that doesn't have a tortoise yet. So what do I need to do? I need to put a burrow, a water dish, plants, and I need to make sure they don't escape. So real quickly, someone yell out where you'd put the burrow. And the green is grass. The green is grass. Top left, corner. Yeah. Top left corner. Sounds good. And this is these are trees. Uh, what else needs to be done to this yard? Barrier. Gate barrier. Yep, that's an open gate right there. So we need a gate barrier. Um, where who, where would you put a water dish? Just there's a few places. Just somewhere where there's shade. Yep, and. So there's a couple other little things that I would do to a yard to make sure it's safe. Yep, I put the burrow up there. I remove those boulders, because they can sometimes climb and flip over boulders if they're not oriented properly. Sometimes you can just move a boulder so that the boulder's um, hard to climb. You can do that. Uh, I pulled away these planters from the walls of the house um, so that the tortoise can walk in between. They were kind of close, and I didn't know if he was going to get stuck there. Uh, one thing I didn't mention was drainage from the roof, but, but yeah, the drainage isn't pointing towards the burrow, so that'll be good. And I put the water dish under a tree. That's all I did. Here's another one. This one's going to be a little bit more difficult. And what I do, I let dandelions grow. I planted some uh, a garden, a uh, salad bar for a tortoise, which is pansies, petunias, little flowers so that they could eat. So that's what I did. All right, this one's going to be a little bit more difficult. What this is is a, a fence that you can see through. They have a pool, a pond, uh, some lawn furniture, and a barbecue. Um, there's the gate, and then there's the drainage. So 
What would you do about the pool or pond? Yeah. What do you think? Put a fence around it, yep, something. And it doesn't have to be a gigantic fence, it just needs to be 18 inches high and flat on the side of the tortoise, that's all it needs to be. What about the, the fence? They can see through it at this point. Put something there. Yep, 18 inches barrier at least, something there. Uh, where would I put a burrow? Somewhere dry. Top, that's an yeah, spot. Away from the pool. Yeah. Yeah. Somewhere where there is where it's dry. Um, okay, and then there's one more thing. Water. Oh yeah, there's that too. What's another thing? Gate barrier. There you go. So I just want want to get you in your head of what all the different things. So I'm pretty close. This is just an idea. I blocked off the pool and pond with an 18-inch high wall. And I did it over here so that I didn't have to worry about the gate barrier anymore. Um, and I put a water dish here. I still put the 18 inch high, I don't know, wood. There, there could be other materials so that they can't see out. And I let dandelions grow, planted a few more plants. So, And where did Jim go? Oh. Okay, I'm gonna do this part then. <laughs> unless, unless do we need a break and then we can come back? Okay, we're gonna take uh, maybe a 15 minute break, grab some food and we'll see how we're doing then. Then buy candy and get your sugar rush going because we have more things to do. There's waters back there. There are a few sodas. I didn't bring too many, but eat those turkey wraps because they're not gonna last forever. Okay, so here's some of our high need activities for volunteering. Uh, one thing that isn't on there is fundraising. If anybody has any fantastic fundraising ideas or fundraising event ideas that they would like to, to do, feel, f please feel free to talk to us. I, yeah, I, we have, we're on there now. Yeah. So we, we're always trying different things online and trying to raise funds uh, in many different ways. We've got our online shelter appeal, but if anybody, as Linda is doing, selling her chocolate back there, I'm just going to put another plug in for, her, for the chocolate. If, uh, if anybody has any great fundraising ideas or wants to run any fundraising events, that's also something that we need help with. The new tortoise shelter, we are going to need volunteers with, with that on a long-term basis. Short-term, we certainly need help with the construction and long term with the feeding and because we're going to have up to 20 tortoises out there we're going to have to keep pretty good records as well so record keeping is going to be a part of that and uh, the, the the shelter designer Richard is here so thanks for coming out <laughs> he's over at the back there and the adoption committee sounds really uh, sounds really formal but it's not that's just hanging out with Janina and helping with adoptions uh, that is everything from yard consultations, which is when Janina goes out initially to check out somebody's yard. So everything from yard consultations to going out to do the actual adoption with a tortoise. So there is a need for that because uh, Janina can't do all of that on her own and it would be nice to have some people to share that out so that we can, it'd be nice to even exceed 100 adoptions this year. I don't know if we will, but the more people that we have that are able to do that, then, then uh, the more homeless tortoises we can adopt. Fairs and events, that's definitely one of the big ones. Um, we go to the pet expo every year. That's coming up in a couple of weeks. If anybody wants to come and help, stand behind the booth. And, and all, all you really have to do is just sort of stand here like this and just say, uh, ask Janina. No, not, not really, but the more information you have, the better. But we, uh, we certainly need people to help out at Pet Expo and just to make things difficult for us, they've added a second day, so Pet Expo is now two days this year. We could maybe uh, get through in one day, but we, we, we like to split a day up into three shifts if we can and, and ha have people help out that way. So we like to have three people at a booth at all times. So that would be either me or Kathy or Janina, and then two other people. 
so that there's somebody that's somewhat experienced, in my case, or, uh, or somebody that's very experienced and then a couple of people that are either uh, learning or, or have already learned all the answers. And we don't expect everybody to know the answer to every question. We still get strange questions that we have no clue what the answer is and we try and find out. And that's always one of the, one of the outs is uh, please, <coughs> please let us get back to you on that one because we don't know the answer. So we've got the Pet Expo, we have the Science Expo coming up soon, which is another, I think it was a two day, it's another two day event. And we also have the Reptile Expo, which we attended for the first time last year, and which we also will be attending again this year because it was so well attended. And there was such great information and such good questions from an audience that was really interested. Um, but there are also other little events that we get invited to that we just we just don't have the number of people to go out there and, and help. So we would definitely like to be able to have more people that are available. And, and what often happens is that if you have two or three events in a row, people get tired, people aren't available that weekend. So it's nice to have a big pool of people that we can ask to come out and help at those uh, fair, fairs and events. Becoming a mega diet seller, if anybody would like to add themselves to the list to sell food, we have a map online which shows the distribution of mega diet sellers. There are one or two little gaps geographically around the Las Vegas area for people selling diet. So if anybody is interested in doing that, that is something else that we need. Distributing flyers and a new adoption care booklet we not only need somebody, well, lots of people to distribute those, we also need somebody to organize it because it's something we're working on right now is we're working on a new little brochure that's going to be handed out to vet clinics, to uh, pet food stores, possibly libraries, um, lots of different places where this flyer is going to have to go. So it would be nice to have somebody who could even coordinate all of that so that it takes away some of that problem from uh, from us having to do it. And it's one of those ongoing things where when you distribute flyers to, I don't know, 150 vet clinics and 40 different pet food stores, you run into the problem of are people displaying it where you want it displayed? Are they even displaying it at all? Are they out? Um, you might find one vet clinic that goes through 50 in a week and then another one you can leave them 50 and go there a year later and they've still got 49 of them, or hopefully not 51. But you, we certainly going to need people to distribute those around the city. So anybody interested in that, that's definitely important. Yeah, yeah, it, it will be, it will be, it will be local. We, we're not expecting somebody to do the entire perimeter of the, of the city. We, we, sort of divide Las Vegas up into a, a pizza, I guess, and everybody gets their own little section to, to deliver. And, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to keep it reasonable and keep it easy to do. But if anybody's interested in, in helping with that, we, we certainly are going to need that in the next few weeks. And if there's anybody interested in, in putting all of that together and coordinating it, that would also be great. Office work is something else that we have needs for with database, with website, social media, and all of those things, and the hotline. Um, we have people that take the hotline for a week. I know Kathy does that religiously. Um, I, I take my turn when, when necessary. We, we have Mor is Morgan's, or Morgan's A, yeah, Morgan, another one that helps out. Uh, do we have anybody, anybody else that's on the hotline? Or? If anybody wants to be on the hotline, that's also something that is uh, a lot of fun. The phone rings at strange times and people ask you strange questions, as, uh, as Morgan can attest to. I, I usually get reasonably easy questions, but uh, some, people, uh, some people get really tough ones and, and also very strange ones. What we found over the last few months is an increase in the number of non-desert tortoise, tortoise questions that we're getting. We're getting sulcata questions and leopard tortoise questions and, um, and Russians and all, all different kinds of tortoises. And 
It's the same as I was saying before. We don't have to know the answers. We just have to take numbers and promise to get back to people with reasonably intelligent answers that we have researched ourselves or that we have we have connections with the herpetological society and with other places where we can sometimes find answers to some of those more obscure questions that we get. Um, and then occasionally you'll get a wrong number as well. Th those ones are, are very easy. But for the most part, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's nice to have new people helping out with that so that we can spread it out so that Kathy doesn't necessarily need to go on there every month or, or I don't have to go on there every month. But that's uh, something that we, we need help with. As you can tell, there's a lot of different things that we do. Um, we, we, you do have a volunteer form in your folder, which would be great if you could fill that out before you leave, if you haven't already filled that out, to tick off some of the things that you want to help with, that you're available to help with, and also what your skills are. You may have a skill set that is completely different to anything that we have right now that we could utilize in some way. So you might say, mm, I have no idea what it might be, but somebody might have a skill that they think would be really, really useful to us and some great ideas for new ways that they can help us. So please feel free to put all of that in on the volunteer form as well if there's anything that you are particularly interested in helping out with. The shelter is a secret location in, uh, in North Las Vegas. It's between Washburn and uh, it's between between Washburn and, and Pahrump. No, it's it's in um, it's it's in it's in northern it's in the northern part of the town. It's um, a private individual has given us access to about an acre of his land, and uh, he's he's helping us out with that. It, and we were able to put our our tortoises on there. But one of the one of the things we really don't want in terms of the publicity of the shelter, we're gonna have to kind of guard it relatively carefully. Obviously, if you're volunteering out there, it's not gonna be a case of blindfolding people, leading them to the site, and then uh, releasing them afterwards somewhere in the desert because they're not allowed to know. But uh, it's something that we, we, we don't want the general public to find out because as the only tortoise group right now, what's gonna happen is Whoever is volunteering to feed the tortoises Monday morning is going to show up, and there's going to be 40 of them that have just been dumped over the uh, over the fence. So, but it, it is in uh, it is in the north part of the town. That's that's as much as I'm allowed to tell you without without being allowed allowed to leave the room. The uh, the. The shelter habitat, as I mentioned, it, it's going to have 20 pens in it to hold tortoises awaiting adoption. It's not meant to be a long-term facility where tortoises um, go and, and live. It's a, it's a place where they're going to go, and Janina is hopefully going to adopt them all out. And we're going to have to follow all kinds of sanitary protocols and feeding, monitoring, reporting. So it is going to be just a little, uh, a little more complicated than just having a couple of tortoises on a piece of land. This is the Desert Tortoise Conservation Center. It, I'm not saying it's gonna look exactly like that, but th that's how the pens are gonna be divided somewhat. The fairs and expos, there's definitely a high need for that. Um, there's even a volunteer opportunity at the end of this event, if anybody wants to help with events such as the monthly meetings. So going to the storage, getting the stuff out of storage, taking it back to storage, after we finish this meeting, we've got to pack everything up and take it to storage. So if anybody wants to volunteer for a field trip, it's not real exciting, but Janina and I will be heading out to the storage facility right after this. And we have to put the room back in order. Well, well yeah, I guess we do, yeah. And, uh, and, and that's also a lot of fun. There's a little map on the back of the, the door that tells us how to do it, but meetings are something that are... I don't say they're a struggle, but they certainly are something that we need help with on a monthly basis from March all the way through to October now that we're doing a couple more monthly meetings than we were in the past. The fairs and Expo is a great way to engage new people and also to run around all the other booths and grab 50 pens and 40 notepads and all of the other things that they have at these events. A lot of them are free, but if there are events that you have to pay to get in, then it is a good way to get in free. Um, 
It's a good way to learn how to use our care sheets. It's a good way to increase your knowledge of tortoises and give things away and play games and sell Mega Diet and sell our t-shirts. Here's uh, one of the booths from last year. Here's one of our board of directors, Laura. That's not a tortoise, as you can well, well tell. Uh, here's some of the strange things that were at the Reptile Expo at the one of the booths. There's me looking almost as if I know what I'm doing. Uh, sterilization clinic, a couple of those coming up this year. Here's four of the tortoises that were operated on last year coming around. So pre and post-op care, health assessments, organization, monitoring. There's the, the map of current sellers of Mega Diet. You'll notice a few little gaps if you're in any of those areas and you want to help out by selling or you know people that may want to, please let us know. And uh, people sell the diet from their home. Delivering, uh, we also mentioned the delivering. All right, so. So quite a few gaps that need to be plugged. We're not going to take a break now. I thought I got away with doing the volunteer thing, but I didn't. So we just switch the uh, things around. Does that mean I'm, I'm back on again? I guess I don't get to hand over to Janina because I was going to do them. Was I going to do that? I guess I was going to do the medical. All right. So anybody can guess what the number one. Yeah. Dog bites. If anybody looked through the uh, the looked through already, then you would have noticed that. But the number one reason that that uh, tortoises end up at the vets is dog bites. Now, one of the things we don't say is that if you have a dog, you can't have a tortoise. But it's certainly um, certainly one of the main reasons that they will visit the vet is problems where people don't sufficiently watch their dogs when they are around tortoises. This is um, this is Janina's dog that would never attack a tortoise. But, but, uh, but, it, but it certainly is uh, it certainly is something that's important in, in terms of um, awareness is that unattended dogs around tortoises is not a great idea. The next thing that's of importance is you may see a little bubble here, just at the end of the nose of the, the tortoise there. Like any pet, a tortoise is gonna need medical care. I think a lot of people, because they're so sturdy and so ancient looking, they think that they don't get sick. They do, they can. Um, they also need to go to the vet on a regular basis for checkups, the same as other animals. But blowing a bubble like this may not be necessarily something that's a problem, but it could well be a sign of URTD, an upper respiratory problem. So we do recommend a checkup once a year. Tortoises can get runny noses. Um, as, as you see the bubble there, you might not necessarily see the bubble. Uh, but one of the things that you might see is residue from a runny nose. You might see patches on their arm because they, do, they can't really get access to Kleenex. So what they do is they rub their, their face on their, on, on their limb and you'll see those marks. Um, you may see things such as uh, problems with the eyes, bulging eyes, cloudy eyes, discolored skin, shell peeling, diarrhea, lots of things that can go wrong with. And, and you'll also see the strange picture there. These are ticks along the underside of, of, a, of an arm. Not that you would necessarily be looking for those, but they can get ticks. Regular checkups for parasites such as that, bladder stones, females can get egg bound, um, upper resp is, is an issue. And that's one of the reasons why when people talk about, and you'll see it in the news, you may have seen it in the news all year about well, there's too many pet tortoises and there's not enough wild tortoises. Just take the pet ones and dump them out into the desert. 
That's one of the reasons why not, because we certainly don't want to be taking a disease like upper rest and putting it into the wild population. You may not know that your pet has any kind of disease, but so taking it out into the desert is not a good idea. You, we also may see malnutrition, pyramiding, um, some of the photographs that you may have seen of desert tortoises where they're not a perfectly round, beautiful sh shell shape, um, can be caused by malnutrition and also indoor raised tortoises can, not, can have many, many different issues. Um, vet may suggest an x-ray, there's a nice normal x-ray. Here's a couple of bladder stones, can be caused by improper diet, lack of water. They can get big. I know um, Kathy's tortoise had an operation for, for those, and I'm not sure what the size was, but big. Yeah, yeah. and those, they, they, yeah, they, they can, they can get huge. Janina's been trained in doing these health assessments, so Janina can tell whether they have uroliths. You can tell from an x-ray quite easily. But, uh, here's a, an x-ray of a urolith and three eggs. Eggs may become egg-bound. Anybody that's had any experience with chickens knows that that can kill an animal b just by a female being egg-bound. They can also become calcified. May or may not need surgery. Um, Microchipping. We now microchip tortoises. When people lose or find animals, they usually assume that a cat or a dog is going to be microchipped. They don't usually think that with a tortoise. They don't find a tortoise and think, oh, I wonder if it's microchipped. Well, microchips from tortoise group are now um, done routinely. It can be done by a vet. It can be done by somebody that's trained to do microchipping, such as Janina. Um, so when we, what we recommend when people find one is to take it to a vet and the, the microchip goes in in the, sh the shoulder area. So if somebody finds one, we recommend they take it to the vet, get them to scan it, and it may have a microchip in it. Now, there are several different companies that make microchips, so we just hope that they have a, a universal reader that reads them all. We have a universal reader that doesn't read some microchips from certain companies. Uh, it's just one of those things. We, we were doing stuff out at the DTCC with some of their tortoises that they had all of the microchip numbers and none of them scanned on our scanner, which is a universal microchip or so, or a universal reader. So you, you, there's no guarantee that it'll even be able to read, but it certainly it's something that should be checked. Also something that Janina does is put the telephone number on a very small piece of paper that uh, only she can read. Either that or I'm getting old and I can't read them anymore, but she, uh, she puts a, the number on a very small piece of paper and that is attached with glue to the back of one of the scoots. And w what we uh, avoid is the, the growing area of the, of the scoot because you don't want to put anything on that, which is sometimes you'll get, or you'll see tortoises that are painted or that have sequins stuck on them and the reason why that is still living tissue. It's not just hard like the end of your fingernail that you can trim off. It, there's living tissue there so painting a tortoise is not a good idea. And as you'll see here, growth, growth rings. Not like a tree where you can tell the age of a tree by just counting the, the rings. These are the same principle, each one of these rings it represents growth, but each one is a growing season as opposed to a year. So you can't just tot up all of these rows and just say it is X number of years old because you may get two to three rings per year. So you can only really guesstimate, but you can in the same way as with, with trees, you can see when you get a wide band, that means lots of growth. So lots of food available. If it was a wild tortoise, you know that that was a good, particularly good growing season. If it's, um, in a, if it's in a pet, generally the, the rings are going to be pretty close together if they're, uh, if they're eating the same amount. 
and they're also going to be wider because they're going to grow a lot faster in in uh, captivity than they are in the wild. Because as with everything, we overfeed our pets. Now it's going to go over to Janina for. Uh, I, I actually thought this was a photo of of a tortoise that couldn't see over the fence, but I guess not. He's trying to see the the Super Bowl game. Is that right, Jim? Yep. Yeah. So I get the I get the fun um, the uh, the fun section reproduction. So um, tortoises can reproduce the entire time that they're active. Um, females can uh, store her sperm for many years and uh, two to three, and we've heard up to ten or eight, even fifteen years. So we've heard different accounts. Um, they females can lay up to three clutches a year, and each clutch can have um, three to ten eggs and so if she has viable sperm after one mating that's um, as many as 30 30 babies each year so you can see if uh, a gravid um, a gravid female that's uh, fertilized in a backyard or if she has access to a male for a long time how quickly that like that yard that we mentioned earlier um, 50 tortoises can end up in a backyard um, and then if they live 80 to 100 years, like humans, that's an extreme amount of babies. And one thing to note is that that's a, an excellent survival tactic in the wild. That's why that they're able to do that is because they have, again, a 100-acre home range. They might only see a male once or twice, maybe once a year, maybe less, maybe once every five years. So th that's a survival uh, tactic in the wild, but in, the, in captivity, it's not necessarily a great thing. Uh, do the females lay eggs if they're not fertilized? Yes. Yes, they do. If they're not uh, sterilized, then yes. Sometimes. Yeah, sometimes. It, it, it can depend on um, how good their food is that year or how they're feeling. They can uh, pick and choose when, uh, kind of when a good year is happening. They're getting a lot of food and they're like, oh, okay, it's time to lay some eggs. So one, one big message to the public is that we ask that you separate a mating pair. Um, and you, you know, answering the public's questions, you're gonna get a lot of people that say, I have a boy and a girl and they're having babies and I give away my babies and during Christmas. And so you want to maybe uh, politely discuss with them that we have, how many hatchlings did we deal with last year, Kathy? 55, that's just ones that we knew about that were homeless. We have a backyard breeding sheet that is in all your folders, correct? And so you can read that over, but that's a, that's a resource to answer those questions. So you can give up a tortoise, consider sterilization. Um, so I wanna talk about how a female reproduces. She digs her hole with her back uh, her back nails, and we're still going to discuss the differences between boys and girls, and so that's one big difference is that females have uh, really long back nails uh, comparative to their front nails. And she digs her nest, she packs dirt around the egg, covers the nest, she might even urinate on it. Um, I've heard for di several reasons it might deter predators and it also might give the egg some humidity or, you know, some moisture. I've heard a couple different things as to why she might do that. Um, and that's pretty close to all she has to do. They're about the size of a ping pong ball. Very, very close. Um, after 90 to 120 days, Hatchling uses a special tooth and um, to poke through the hole and poke through the egg and emerge. It creates a little hole in the egg and pokes through. Um, one thing I want to note is that at 88 degrees Fahrenheit is what determines between a boy and a girl. And if they, this is how I remember it. So if they're hot mamas, if they're above that 88 degrees, they're gonna be female. If they're below, they're gonna be male. If they're right on, and this is in the nest, if they're right on that cusp, they can become both. They can be hermaphroditic. And there is not much information on that either. So that's, uh, that's your thesis right there if you're trying to do some tortoise studies. 
Um, although adorable, um, there's a dandelion right there. Uh, so they can, they still have their egg sac attached to them and it has enough nutrients to survive for a first, uh, even I've heard up to a, even six months, which I think is a long time, but at least a month in their first uh, of life. And that gives them enough time to go around and wander and see if there is a place that has enough food, find a, either find a burrow that a little mouse is, has created or maybe dig one of their own. It gives them enough time to do that. There we go. I really wanted to show this, so. Here's some. Now we won't be able to get back to the PowerPoint. Nope. <laughs> so he's using his egg tooth, poking out of the shell. And as you can see, it's right there. And do your adult tortoises have it? No, no they don't. It, they reabsorb it. It's called an egg tooth, but it's not technically a tooth. It's a, it's a, a scale that I believe they reabsorb back in. So if you are looking at hatchlings, that's one, one way to tell if they're really brand new and same thing with an egg sac on their bottom. There's that tooth there. <laughs> they are adorable. Sorry, there's just music to this video, but it is on the Arizona Department of Wildlife's website. These are desert tortoises. No, that's something I was going to point out. No, uh, their skin is so fragile and gentle, and uh, you taking off their shell might you might actually rip their own skin. Um, it'll pop, it'll come off eventually. So we'll see a couple <laughs> pictures <laughs> later. There he says hi. Yeah, it gets their blood flowing possibly. Get them to breathe heavy. Get their lungs going. Oh yeah, and that's uh, one reason why uh, desert tortoises lay so many eggs is that in the wild, they don't all survive. Very similar to sea turtles. I, I, I don't know the exact percentage, but it's not too many that do survive. There are predators out in the wild. Uh, ravens, coyotes, uh, Gila monsters eat the eggs and, and I believe the new hatchlings. So we're gonna see the egg sac in just a second. Oh, there he goes. There's the egg sac. So it's big right now, but it'll it'll shrink up and go underneath his his shell. Oh, there's the first one. There they go. Are. And so, and you see the, the researchers did not remove his shell on top. They, they let them do that naturally. No. I don't think so. They don't, they wouldn't need to. They have enough nutrients in their, in their egg sac to last them um, a few months. Well, that's just the internet. So there are a lot of hatchlings in Nevada, of course. And so we do always recommend that a tortoise lives outside. They are, this is their habitat. They have the proper temperatures and, and they do receive a lot of nutrients from the sun, uh, including vitamin D, but others. And that's how they um, get their bone to form underneath their shell. So when they're, in, when they're in their egg, the bone hasn't formed yet and they're still really soft and pliable, but they need sunlight in order to develop this bone properly. And so that's one reason why we say no terrariums, even for hatchlings, um, no, no lamp, even if it does have UVB, UVA, it just doesn't compare to the natural sun. So we do recommend that 
A tortoise lives outdoors, and they can eat all the same plants. They can eat mega diet. Um, but you might want to have some other uh, precautions, maybe a cover on top from birds or cats or dogs even, your own dogs. So th but, but we have um, an online care sheet, uh, several care sheets, just, just all about hatchlings. Um, and just to mention again, we do have a hatchling foster program that we work with Nevada Department of Wildlife uh, for any unwanted hatchlings as we, we can't adopt them out, but we do work with them and they survey the land and uh, we put them out in the desert with Nevada Department of Wildlife. Who else helps us with that? Just them? Nevada Department of Wildlife? Well, fish and, wildlife. F and fish and wildlife, okay. Just wanna make sure. So here's a couple habitats. Um, again, a nice, a nice burrow here. There's a lot of this dirt on top, really snug burrow. You can see it's just this tiny little opening. And as the tortoise gets bigger, he's gonna kick out all that dirt. These aren't burrows, these are just shade areas. And then we have three burrows back there. This is one of our foster habitats. Here's a little guy there, there's a little guy there. They have water dishes. So the, the needs, and these are some gazanias and a few other items. We have a wet, wet area and then a dry area for the burrows, very similar to an adult uh, tortoise. And then here's the, here's uh, this burrow, and it's not covered up in dirt yet. I wanted to show you this is a tile, and we make sure that there's a lot of dirt in here, so this area is really snug. Okay, boys and girls. Um, we're gonna quickly go through them, and then we're gonna have a sh very quick activity. Um, and I need a tortoise. We're gonna use, okay. So we're gonna look at a few things. Uh, mainly the shell. The top part is called the carapace. Bottom part is called the plastron. One thing that boys have is a dip in the back of their plastron here. And, and then they also have a hump back here. And that could be for stabilization and mating. Um, as females don't have either of those. This, uh, he's still not a, a very old tortoise. He doesn't have a huge guler horn, but that's for fighting for other tortoises. Uh, male tortoises will go up under. So other male tortoises will come up with their guler horn and when they're fighting and flip over a tortoise. And in, if you do know that they're fighting, you'll see a lot of blood under here. So, um, and males again, they have the same nail length as females have a lot longer. Tails, boys sometimes have longer tails and they stick it up to the side, whereas females are really short. That could be because of egg deposition, not sure. Um, and one thing that males also do have are chin glands. And this, this guy, he's still really young, but some of those big older tortoises, my tortoises are huge, they have chin glands up at the front. Okay, that's not gonna work. That's really not gonna work. <laughs> so here's a picture, we have a care sheet here that's online and that you should all have it in your packet too. And so again, females have, they're flat on the bottom on the plastron, males have a dip and a big hump and large chin glands, a large guler horn for fighting. And that's just a couple quick things. So, and not all tortoises exhibit these um, identifications very well. Sometimes you have to use a few different ones to determine, and maybe this male isn't old enough to have a big guler horn, so you do have to use a multiple of these together in order to determine uh, male or female. So, can somebody guess? Shout it out, boy or girl? Boy, why? Yeah, that thing's huge. That thing's huge. Um, also, this is a, really a, a picture about the chin glands. You can, I don't know if you can tell, but they, these are huge. They stick out. Sometimes they ooze 
uh, liquid, they waft pheromones in the air when they bob, when they're mating, bob up and down. So he's got some pretty big chin glands and that's one reason why you need to go to an experienced vet because some vets have been known to try and take those off. They are completely normal unless they are infected and that doesn't happen very often. So um, those are normal and natural to be enlarged, especially during fighting seasons. Okay, what do you think? Male. Male. Is that what you think? Why? That's the big hump. He has a hump and then it goes straight down. Females kind of go fan out a little bit. So his, and that's more towards his leg. This is his back part, so. Oh yeah, I wonder who it is. people, someone shoots me a cell phone here, and I do my very best, trust me, shoots me a cell phone number here, an email address here. I really need you to fill out the adoption application, A, so you know what, what it takes to adopt a tortoise and to care for a tortoise, B, and, and make sure that I have all your information in one place. Um, and you're willing to do these things, build a burrow in a, in a dry area, shaded water dish, plants, removal gate barrier. Um, again, we've already mentioned be a part of the adoption, adoption team. We do at this time, we do have a $75 adoption fee for tortoises and it does go back to uh, help more um, homeless tortoises to be adopted. And again, we do limit to one per, per household that is our adoption policies. Uh, so, so if you're at booth and people are asking, how do I adopt, you say, what do you say? Fill out the adoption Call application. Kathy. Call Kathy. <laughs> and she, what will she say? No, no, well, she'll say what? Actually, she, she doesn't always. What do you, what do you tell them? Yep, that's, that's the, the, the beginning of adopting a tortoise. So we're almost done. And we want to make sure that we have a, one more quick activity to do, and that says we're going to go through all these questions, um, but I'm going to need your help answering them. <laughs> so, and we're going to go through these. What I want to use is any materials that we have, or maybe you just don't know the answer, and what, do you, what would you say when you don't know the answer? I'll check for you. Yeah. Yeah, or you can have them contact us. Yep, we're going to have our, our cards at the booth here. You can hand out our cards and say, I don't know, but I, I believe this person will know, and that's the way to do it, and we're gonna do our best, so. Um, you wanna help out? You wanna be my Vanna White, or do you wanna do that? Can I be the Vanna White? 
Sure, we'll go over to the first one. And uh, Habitats and Burrows was our first category. And the first question, how long should we keep paper stuffed in the borough entrance? Now, is it, that's not something that we cover. Is anybody going to ha have a stab at answering that one or how they would answer it? I took yep. mine out after Captain sent the email and I stuffed it in there. I took it out as soon as the rain stopped. Follow directions. <laughs> <laughs> Common sense. Common sense, following directions. Yeah, absolutely. But, but if, you're, uh, if you're able to answer that question and you're standing behind our booth, great. If not, Ask Janina, or um, ask Kathy, or ask myself, ask, ask me, ask whoever else is there so that they can maybe answer it. If you don't know the answer, then just take somebody's information and we will get back to them. Yeah. Speaking of ice, one of the next questions on here is, do tortoises need snowshoes in Reno? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Skis, but not snowshoes is the, is the answer to that one. No, is it, again, uh, does anybody have a, an answer to that that they would give to a member of the public if that was the question somebody asked you? Yeah. They live indoors in the wintertime. Very good. There's some really good questions here. Um, what temperature inside the burrow will the tortoise wake up? That's, that, that's, yeah, that's another really tricky question that it's gonna be, yeah, well, Diane. Mm -hmm. In reverse to that question, Clover would not go to sleep until the temperature drops to 58. 58? So until it got 58, So it's, there, there are so many factors that it, it, that's going to be one that's really hard to answer because tortoises are going to vary individually. The, the yard is going to vary. The elevation is going to vary. So th there are going to be so many different factors to answer a question like that. But just... Uh, uh, yeah, day, day length maybe. Yeah. So it's a, it's a great question, and it's one that um, if you were asked that question, you could either refer to somebody else, or you could just uh, just just give a few of those. I don't, I don't say that they're vague answers, but answers that would certainly um, certainly show that it, it is a difficult question to answer. No, it's it's. Uh, it's I mean, as Janina was mentioning about some of these theses, there's, there's thesis number two and three right there on, on um, coming out of brumation. Which one? How, how do they stay warm outside in the winter? It, it's, <clears throat> it's, a, it's a trick question, maybe. But, but it's, it's also... It's, it is true that we do get, when you're standing there answering questions from the public, at the, at the Reptile Expo, <clears throat> a lot of knowledge from, from people because they're, I don't say they're experts, but they have some knowledge of reptiles. But when you're standing there at the Pet Expo and you have people that don't really know much about tortoises, there's the potential to be a asked some strange questions and some interesting questions that are, uh, how do they stay warm outside in the winter? We still get people that come up and say, I feed my tortoise lettuce, and, and I have my tortoise indoors in the wintertime, and they don't, they don't necessarily hibernate, or we have a lot of people that don't know 
good care. So we do get questions that relate to poor care. And you can't just say to somebody, you're doing it all wrong. It's, it's, you have to be diplomatic. But that's, that's potentially a question. How, how do they stay warm outside in the winter? They, well, they, they, shouldn't, they shouldn't be out in the winter. Is, is really, they're they're going to be hibernating. Is, is, is the, they're going to be they, Yeah, we want them to we want them to stay at a low temperature in in the uh, in the winter time in their burrow. If we're talking about Reno, then they're going to be in the garage at a temperature roughly around 48, between 45 and 50. 48 being being what we're told from people in Reno is the, is the optimum. How cold can a tortoise brew mate in? Those. Uh, the next one is sulcatas. Can sulcata tortoises have the habitat burrow outdoors, or are they supposed to stay in temperatures above 70 at all times? And we, we often get asked the difference between t turtles and tortoises, and that, that's basically just, they're all turtles, tortoises are just land turtles, is the, is the easy answer to that one. I saw a question over there. I was just going to point out that to me it's different than I was going to ask if someone was from Sulcatas and desert tortoises, is Sulcatas are from Africa and they're made, they do not ruminate. Right. So One. Th this one's already already covered. Okay, so we'll move over to the next. I thought we had four. Well, we, uh, they must must both be both be together. The law and the tortoise. Can I have two tortoises? Hopefully, everybody can answer that one now. All right. The trick question, kind of. If so, if somebody doesn't have a tortoise. And they come up to you and say, can I adopt two? The answer is no. If they already have two tortoises, then it's, um, it's, it's not necessarily no. At the, dis at the booth, many people ask, is that tortoise real? And the answer, <laughs> yes, it, yes, it was, yes. Still, still is real, just is, is no longer with us in the living sense, but uh, was a tortoise, and, and we are legally allowed to have that as a, as a tortoise for educational purposes. The Mojave Desert spans a few states. Why can the local tortoises not be adopted out to these other areas? They passports. Passports. <laughs> Be 
because those areas already have problems with pet captive tortoises, as well as the same thing that we do. So they don't, they don't want ours. Um, there are instances where rescues and habitats have taken tortoises from, from Nevada, but they've worked very closely with the Nevada Department of Wildlife and Fish and Wildlife Service to be able to do so. Uh, but as a general rule, no. Uh, I think Arizona had over 300 tortoises this year that needed homes all in a warehouse at one time. So, I'll just do the next one. Do you have a, it, do you have to have a permit uh, with fish, fishing game to own a tortoise, registered and numbered? Well, I think we mentioned that, that we are the Nevada's um, registration uh, permit say, per se. Um, so that's us. And yes, you do. You're supposed to. Um, do I need an inspection of my yard to keep a tortoise? No, you don't have to have us come over. We'd certainly love to and talk about ideas. I'm not going to come over and say, oh, this is awful. I'm not going to do that. But I will explain to you why things are dangerous. Um, but to keep your tortoise? No, but you should register it on our website. Crossing the road. What do we do if you see a tortoise and it's crossing the road? You should hold it low, right? It all depends on what kind of road. Does it tear the road up? Yeah, yeah. that's true, too. <laughs> that's true, too. you got to be a little smart. That's only if its life is in danger. So that's a good point. Only if its life is in danger. If you find that the tortoise is on the egg, should you destroy the egg or get them back? Um, legally, I don't believe you're allowed to incubate them on purpose. You're not. Uh, you are supposed to surrender them to Nevada Department of Wildlife. So, yes, if you, if you, I, <laughs> if you were really, I will never know the answer to that question, I'm sorry. <laughs> never happened in my lifetime. <laughs> Unless someone plays a really cruel joke on me. <laughs> They have a Gila monster. They have a Gila monster that they do, they don't specifically breed tortoises to feed them, but um, they, the Gila monster, that is a natural diet for them. And they, they actually received this Gila monster in Reno where they don't live. And so he's, so they do have a captive Gila monster, which is very dangerous, by the way. Um, okay, let's, uh, I can't, you wanna put that in front of here? Not that anyone can really read them that far anyway, right? Uh, plants and diet. Sources for seeds and plants. So what if somebody came up to you and asked, where do I get tortoise plants? What could you say? Star Nursery, and they even have lists um, right there at their desk so they can help you pick plants out. Yeah, we, yep, you got the list there. And, and we are working with Star Nursery. Some of them do have our list, but we really want to have more of them to have our list as well. And that's uh, something that a volunteer could do is, is make sure in distribution, go to the Star Nurseries or the Star Nursery near your house and make sure that they have our list. All of these lists are on our website too, by the way. So you're, they're always available to the general public at any time. Um, but we would, for, we would give you a list if you were to become a distributor. So if, if you're at the booth, you can talk to them if you know the answers you can give them out the sheet and you can also refer people to our website referring people to our website is great because there's so much information on there that, that isn't necessarily on the sheets or in our heads potentially Diane um, spring preserve plant sale too because they have a lot of the bigger bushes and stuff that you don't you can't get at the star yeah, the Springs Preserve Sale, and um, they have it twice a year. They're a little bit more expensive, but they do have a lot of native plants that you wouldn't necessarily find at Star Nursery or Home Depot or places like that, so that's great. Yeah. If somebody wanted to get at Home Depot or where not, do you have to worry about any exercise on the kettles, like for the, um, the 
Yeah, exactly. Have we heard of anything? No, but that's uh, one reason why you don't go around harvesting dandelions out of people's yards. Maybe the seeds are fine because you can grow the seeds in your yard, but not the actual dandelion. You don't know if there's herbicides on there, pesticides, or what. Um, okay. Where did we, where did we? Pomegranates in yard. Okay for tortoise. Any part. What do you guys think? No. Nope. Exactly. Probably even the even the rind. I wouldn't. I would assume the rind even has some sugar in it. I wouldn't think so. Yeah. Well, some, I've I've seen them in my yard. If I've never went and picked them. Why do cactus have to be needleless for a tortoise to eat? I don't know. What would your guys' answer be? Yeah. It depends. It's um, even even the spineless cactus will still have some little prickles on it, um, but they're a little bit softer. They they hurt to us, but a tortoise can munch on them. Yeah, they don't. They can. Yep, exactly. They, they only do the new growth, which has soft spines on it. They can munch them down. They, they can eat the, the spines. Um, it's not something I would particularly feed to my tortoise. Um, but they can get um, impactions in their jaw, and that actually has to do a lot with red brome as well in the wild. That's an a invasive plant that is really bad for tortoises, so they get impactions in there. Uh, it, it, some, they can do it, but there's always a chance of injury too. But if the wild tortoise has nothing else to eat, then probably going to eat it. You're really worried about the spines. They come off really quick for some reason. They just come flame. A flame? Off. Ooh. Yeah. We're getting um, exciting over here. Well, that makes it tricky. You know, why <laughs> the prickly pear fruit has the same problem. So if you take them, you put them on your grill or on the oh. stove really quick. It doesn't have to be very long. Like literally like Cooking 30 cactus. seconds is all it takes. And you just fry it right off like there. I'm going to have to try that. <laughs> so the really young ones. The older ones, like the actual spines themselves. Yeah, th you're just talking about the little the little ones that would get in our skin that we would never be able to get out, and the, they're going to be there for the next three days. Yeah, you're right. Neat. I didn't know that. Um, are grape leaves good for tortoises? Yes. yes. What is it on the grape plant that's not grape. good? Grape. The grape. Plus, you want to eat those, right? Um, how much should my tortoise eat and drink? Is cold or hot food better? What do you think? So, go ahead. The mega diet, I've noticed if you take the warm water, not hot water, but warm water uh -huh. and, and put it in there, it pops up faster and Interesting. more complete. But I've never done the cold experiment. water, it just kind of floats around in there until it gets warm and then it pops up. I'm going to start doing my mega diet with warm water and then. Maybe it puffs up faster. Well. Oh yeah, but when you got a hungry tortoise and she's banging on the door. <laughs> so how much should your tortoise eat and drink? It just exactly. I don't know how much. I don't have an actual uh, amount of that what your tortoise should be eating because they are opportunistic eaters. But, but if you think about how much they eat in the wild compared to how much we feed them, in general. So that's why if you're going on vacation and you have plants in your backyard, you don't have to worry about them. You know, if they if they skip a few days without mega diet, you're you're he'll be okay. What is the yeah, what is the white powder in urine? Urate salts. Yes, we and that's a good thing that your tortoise is flushing those because if they're not flushing them, what do they turn into? Stones. 
Yep. Why does my tortoise poop in burrow? Is that unhealthy? I say because it's his home. I don't know. Because it was too cold to go outside. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> don't believe it's unhealthy. Uh, tortoises have, uh, will sometimes even um, eat their own. I've heard to uh, re-inoculate their gut, um, intestine tract. Um, so, exactly, yep. It's, it's to get all those um, bacteria back in their uh, guts that might not have, might not be there. Um, is it unhealthy? I don't think so. I would clean, you know, you don't even have to clean it out, but every once in a while I'll stick my hand down in there and brush it out. But I don't think it's unhealthy. So now we're on the general tortoise square. And I, I, I want to mention that all of these questions are fantastic, by the way. Really appreciate you guys writing down all these. How much water should a tortoise consume in a year? I'm not sure. <laughs> I do know that they can hold a lot of water, I believe up to a liter at one time if it's a really big tortoise, that's just a lot of water. And, and a question like that's a good opportunity to talk to people about how they take in water and the size of the water dish and to talk about water in general, that it should be available, that it should be clean. So it's, even if you don't necessarily know the answer because it's kind of a little obscure, then Exactly. Right. So there are going to be different answers depending on where they are, and, and so it is one of those questions and that you can utilize to your advantage. So it, it certainly a, a pet tortoise might be different than a wild tortoise, and perhaps there has been some research done on this particular topic in, in wild tortoises, but it's going to be completely different in, in pet tortoises. So, ah, great point. If my tortoise has three long nails and one short nail, should I clip her long nails? Seems like a medical question. I was like, I knew that was. <laughs> no, no, this, this actually is my question because um, Clover has a back foot that has, okay, her left one has long nails, but the pad touches the ground. The right mm. one has long nails, but the pad doesn't, doesn't touch the all the way ground. hit the ground. So when she walks, it's always like she's like a quarter of an inch higher on the one side. So I didn't know if I should clip those nails and so she could. So. What I would do if anyone comes to me with any medical questions that I don't am not comfortable with. Um, they make orthotics for that purpose. Do they have a little gel insole for yeah, her? Yeah, Seeing a shoulder. veterinarian <laughs> with tortoise experience. Um, I don't know if tortoise nails are similar to dog nails. I don't know that. Um, uh, general rule of thumb. That's not something I would, I'd say, do yourself. I would only do it under um, guidelines with a vet. I mean.
from an organization, any medical questions, we do have to say, see a vet. Um, you know, you can teach people what signs of sickness are. You can't recommend um, any type of, besides changing their diet and habitat, any procedures that to do themselves. It would have to be under recommendation with a vet. I don't know. A Dremel? Tortoise, you know, similar to dog's nails, you have to be really careful. So that's yeah. perhaps exactly. So would somebody who doesn't know what they're doing cut their tortoise nails? No. So. I have not either. Again, well, you can take her to a vet. She's, we've had her almost a year now. It's time yeah. for a checkup. So, and um, so that might be an idea. Are the tortoises in Southern California, Arizona, and Nevada the same species as desert tortoise? In, in California, Arizona, and Northern Nevada, let's say the west of the Colorado River. Yes. 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 What are they? What about east of the Colorado River, which would be Arizona? Yeah, just Arizona. So great. Yep. Do they feel the high humidity in the late summer like humans? What do you think? They can sense when it's going to rain, so I would say yes. Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're out there too. They, they have a, I'd call it an internal barometer. And that's why when you mentioned earlier, it, the very highest temperatures, they all become a little bit inactive because it's too hot. It, they don't feel it the same way as we do because they're cold blooded and we're not cold blooded. But it, certainly the temperature, they're definitely temperature driven in their responses. Is there any? to put on tortoise shell to moisturize. Oh, yeah. Ponds work very good. Pond, water, ponds, 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 ponds lotion. No, no actually, there, when, I, when I was at the Reptile Expo, the booth next to us, they were saying that yes, there is a balm you can buy to put on the tortoise shell. And I was joking, it was turtle wax. <laughs> Do wild tortoises have stuff put on their shell? No. Okay. Either. And um, again, this is growing tissue, and I'm sure they have their own oil that they secrete. You know, I, I don't know for sure, but I'm pretty sure, you know, as bodies secrete their own oils. Um, if you put something on there and it isn't proper, it, it could you could be damaging the shell. Is it a is it a risk you're willing to take? Me personally, I would not. And as we've already, as already said many times, and that you, that you're aware of, is we're trying to, in a, in, we're trying to um, reproduce the wild environment in the pet environment, in the home. So, as Janina just said, it's not going to be something that they would do in the wild. So, why would we necessarily do it in a, in a home? And I know there are products out there people say coconut oil, people say all kinds of different oils, but. We don't, we don't recommend anything. What is the difference between hibernation and brumation? You want to go over that one again? Linda. There you go. <laughs> Reptiles brumate. Reptiles brumate. So it's a little bit further than that. Not a great, there's physiologically not a great deal of difference. It's a time of um, 
resting over the winter, but with, with mammals, with hibernation, it's building up a fat that you live on over the winter. With reptiles, they, you'll notice that they don't eat before they go into brumation, and they, they're basically slowing down their metabolism. So it, it, one is slowing down the metabolism, and the other is living off fat that they've just put on in order to be able to live over the winter. So that's the, the, the main difference, kind of. What effect does excessive backyard breeding have on the genetics of the offspring, i.e. brother breeding with sister, etc.? It's, um, it's one of the reasons when we say that we don't want pet tortoises going into the wild, that's another very good reason is that it's very possible that when we talk about those 54 tortoises in the one backyard that they are, that there is interbreeding. And that's something that after a few generations, putting those back in the wild is going to be quite, quite bad for the wild population because we don't want to be introducing um, inbreeding or inbred tortoises into a wild population. So yes, that's a very good question and, and I don't know that there's necessarily any, any study on that yet, but it's, it's, uh, it's important. Yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the sterilization clinic, any of the, the quite a few of the, of the tortoises that were at the sterilization clinic had pathologies, so they had something wrong with them. Um, they didn't operate on well, and, and maybe 10 or 15 tortoises were not operated on at all because they were deemed to be non-operable because they w weren't well. All of the tortoises that, that had problems or that couldn't be operated on came out of the yard with the 54 tortoises with the backyard breeding. So some of that potentially could be the fact that you've got too many tortoises in a small space, could be poor diet, but in general, it's probably going to be that, that um, the backyard breeding has caused those problems. Can my tortoise socialize with my bearded dragon? Yeah. They, 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 they like. They, 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 they socialize in terms of they love to be around people. They'll, they like to be around other animals. But, but, but in, in the wild, they're not around a bearded dragon necessarily. But, but certainly, um, it, it's a case of they will get along with other animals in, in a pet environment is, uh, is one of the things that we do want to get across to people because often people will come to the booth, you'll talk to them about tortoises and they'll say, oh, I can't have a tortoise, we've got four dogs. Or I can't have a tortoise, we've got three cats. Well, it's, it's trying to overcome some of those barriers that yes, maybe if your four, four dogs all need muzzling and they're gonna, just tear a tortoise to shreds, but in, in general, they can get along if, if, if it's a controlled situation. I know Janine wants to say something. So I was thinking that um, as long as there's no disease transference, transmission between the two, that would be a good question for a vet or some Facebook posts. If, if, if they would have anything that they could transmit to each other, yeah. Upper respiratory, I do know reptiles are sus susceptible to res upper respiratory real easy, but usually what causes it in desert tortoises is specific to a uh, species. It's a mycoplasma that exists in desert tortoises, but that could be only something that we know of. There could be others out there, so. I think, well that is everything. Um, I'm gonna hand out some little goodies here to say thank you for coming. Um, one thing that we do have, we, uh, two, two items I wanna talk about is that we do have the Pet Expo coming up. That's not next week and it's the weekend after. Again, it's gonna be two days long. We are looking for volunteers. Uh, we're gonna need at least 10 plus volunteers in order to staff this booth. It's gonna be a really fun event. You're gonna see lots of dogs, lots of kitties and some other um, exotic animals and we're gonna have a booth that's very similar to this and it'll actually be bigger, have a few other items, but uh, please think about if you wanna sign up for that or tell one of us if you definitely wanna shift. We think we're doing about two and a half hour shifts. There, um, 
We are asking uh, somebody who would donate, who would allow us to park at the, what is it called again, the Old Mormon Fort um, for free. But we, they usually let us do that. We haven't got, gotten contact with them. Otherwise, it would be $4 to park. I prefer to park closer because I have to haul stuff in and out anyway. <laughs> but but we, we do usually ask to, for free parking at that event if we can. And we can. Oh, okay. And we will be setting up early. Okay. Well, set the, the event's Saturday, Sunday, and I believe we're setting up Friday night. We're fri we have uh, from 10 to 8 p.m. on Friday to set up, and I'm just going to go whenever we have other time, other volunteers that are willing to help us load in and out. So it's a, it's a good amount of stuff. It's all the stuff you see here and a, a few other extra items too. Um, so please let one of us three know if you're interested. Okay, raise your hand if you want to go to Pet, Pet Expo. Any of those, you know, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Saturday and Sunday is when the activity is. And bear in mind the door's locked until we get 10. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> And one thing that we do try to do is we try to pair you up. If you've never done a, a booth like this before, we do try to pair you up with somebody who has done the booth before um, or somebody who's been around a little bit longer that might know a few more questions. And we're also going to be, be around as well. So um, if, again, if you don't know the answer, say, I don't know. I'm a new volunteer. I have somebody here that might know the answer. Give us a minute. Sign up on our email list. That's very important to us at these booths. That's what tells us if we have been successful at these or not, if we we're going to go again. So emails are very important to us at these events. Somebody donated that booth last year, but we got a really good booth over here. And, and we also want to be in a position where people show up 15 minutes roughly before their allotted time so that if you do have any questions or there are any issues that we can kind of get people ready beforehand so that they don't feel as if they're being thrown into the deep end. Could I bring this one to make sure I've got everybody to raise their hand and then I'll give it to Trini and then she can We're close, we're close. Of course, we can always send out emails as well, but Janita's going to come and hand out some uh, some freebies, or little little uh, toys to thank everybody. Does anybody have any other questions? Because I guess we have to be out of here by five or, or something bad happens. I'm not sure what. Yeah? Sorry? Uh, the, the vets do the sterilization, but we, w our role is just assistance. So. Okay, if you, if you have a, a tortoise that you want to get sterilized, uh, we still haven't worked out the details on how that's going to work out, whether it's going to be for, for pets or not. But th th there will be an opportunity to find out, definitely. We, we do have a vet that, w um, that works with the tortoises that we get in. However, we don't, it, it's not like we recommend a vet at all. We just have one that, that wor works on some of our tortoises. Anybody else have any questions? Please feel free to eat the rest of the food. You can fill in your evaluations as long as they're okay. And <laughs>